Cosmo Babies. On this week's episode, we have a very special guest and a close personal friend of mine, Gerald Sobita, joining us. I am your host, Annie MacArthur. I have my co-host with me today, Russell Mays, and we are going to be talking about hustling at the beginning of your career, but also setting some healthy boundaries. Let's get into it. Healthy boundaries. I don't I don't even know what that word means. <laughs> Boundaries. Mm-hmm. Help me. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm welcome. still learning what boundaries is. <laughs> <laughs> aren't we all? Aren't we yes. All? Aren't we all? Well, welcome to the podcast, my friend. So how long have you been in the business and what got you into it? So um I've been I'm gonna hit eleven years since I walked in beauty school in about two months. I think May, late okay. April or early May, I believe. Um and I got into it because after high school, I just didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know i um, supposed to go to college. I was supposed to go to college, but I didn't want to do that necessarily. And I was just trying to find something like a job to grow into something. But for 10 months after high school, I just couldn't figure it out. It was suggested to me to maybe go into the industry of hair and that hair school is a thing. I didn't even know you have to go to school to be a hairdresser. (laughs) I thought you just like have to have a job or whatever to be good at it. Yeah. (laughs) But friends from high school actually told me that because apparently my personality is very fitting to be a hairdresser. And I've actually never been a client in a hair salon prior to that. Like most of the time I've just gotten my hair cut like at a barbershop, you know, growing up back in the Philippines is is where I grew up. Um, And... uh, When I came here in the United States, like at 15, I, no one could cut my hair in my town, basically. (laughs) No one could cut my type of hair. I have Asian-esque hair. (laughs) It's thick, straight. Well, it's firm right now. So reveal. Um, It's thick, straight. No one could cut it. It's a porcupine. I wanted a Justin Bieber haircut. I left with spikes. Um, (laughs) And so I guess going into the hair industry, I've already been cutting my own hair for four years throughout high school. Uh, it, it just fell into place. Great. Basically. Great. Well, that sounds like some good friends that would support you and suggest that you go into the business. Yeah. And also my mom, she was so tired of me just like figuring things out. So she was like, I am I already booked you. Actually, my mom was the one who pushed me. She's like, I already booked you a tour in, in the beauty school. Oh, that's and awesome. I, yeah. Yeah. So it was it was kind of nice to be pushed like that. So something that I I personally just love so much about Gerald's story in general, but also his point of view for where he's at now in his career is that Gerald started before social media. Like you kind of came into the industry at a time where it's like there, there was a lot more hustle like on your feet than for Mm -hmm. like for doing your marketing of, of yourself. And I, I love the point of view that you have about students today, especially how to go out and kind of hustle for those clients in the beginning. I think, um, I don't know if that was a question or a statement. <laughs> it's kind of a statement <laughs> and a question, oh, okay. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you got out of school, you mm-hmm. went and, and do, did you apprentice or assist at a salon or did you go right into a working salon? So I got out of beauty school, I think around April. I was... I knew that after beauty school that, you know, it's adult time, it's grown up time. I'm not going to. So I actually spent the whole summer like I was still living at my mom. So I had it easier at that time. But I actually did not work at a hair salon for maybe a good three months Um, after beauty school. I, um, I what I did was I had since I am in town where I went to high school. I had enough friends from high school to do their hairs Mm -hmm. at their houses. So I did house calls for a good three months. And then it became like house calls for my, you know, recommendations from those friends, their own family members. So that's what I did. I just wanted like a free summer before I really started getting into the hair. And then I worked um, and then I applied at several high end salons in town, actually, And I think it kind of broke my confidence down a little bit because I just felt like such a beginner. I never entered an apprenticeship program throughout beauty school. I didn't really think I was good enough. I just kind of went with the flow. Ended up landing a job at a hair hair salon in a mall, which was a corporate salon. 
Mm-hmm. And that's my first job ever. So how long did it take before you started to feel confident that, yes, this is going to be great. This is what I can do. And I can build a successful career from this. Not until I started working from House of Pop. Okay. So that was probably a good two years into the industry. Um, uh, at the end, after like within a year and a half to two years while working in this mall salon corporate I was actually only making minimum wage. And at that time, I was also lucky to be working in that environment where it wasn't just a haircutting place. It was also a color, perms and cuts. And clients were actually loyal to stylists rather than the um, the corporate salon. And I had a lot of freedom in the, in the salon. I got to do whatever I needed to do. That's where I learned a lot of bad and good, but I was still, I felt like I wasn't making enough money and Mm -hmm. I just, I didn't know really. I was just going with the flow. So for those that don't know, House of Pop is the salon of Douglas McCoy, the Douglas McCoy. (laughs) So what would you say was the difference between the, the, the mall salon and then going to working for Douglas? Was it just the expectation um, it, there was actually a lot of freedom and trust mm-hmm. when I got into Douglas's salon. He kept reminding me, you know, that whatever I do, it's my show. Um, he also, I think just, I can feel the trust that he gave me that the other people in the management and a lot of the hairdressers that already were working there uh, and having the freedom of taking it in whatever direction I wanted to take it. That was, I guess, one of the biggest differences. And that's when I realized that I do like taking a little bit of control and like giving myself my own direction with guidance and support Mm -hmm. and trust. Do you feel like working at a corporate salon for two years before going into more of a like standard salon, high-end salon, do you feel like that allowed you to create a foundation of clients before transferring over into something that had a little bit of a higher level of expectation? Um, In terms of clients, not really. I did like, I still have maybe two or three clients from that corporate salon that still follows me to this day at House of Pop. But sorry, what was that question? (laughs) (laughs) Like, like, do you feel like you were able to build the skills and kind of that know-how to build a clientele? like to be able to then support yourself. Yes. I was in that corporate salon, you know, I was absorbing everything. Mm -hmm. I unsubconsciously really, I just like to think a lot, but I didn't know I was absorbing (laughs) everything. I've never had a job prior to working for that salon. I didn't have any, um, you know, customer service job prior to that, but working there and having a little bit of freedom there as well, really helped me create that skill. And I think, I don't know. That's where I kind of earned a little bit of confidence as well. Definitely. I, Mm -hmm. something Russell and I have talked about before on podcasts is going into those corporate style salons right out of school can be such Mm -hmm. a great stepping stone for people Mm -hmm. because it really allows you to kind of figure out things, you know, figure out cutting hair, figure out coloring hair, figuring out how to talk to clients and get them to come back to you again. And so Mm -hmm. sometimes they're really great resource in in those beginning stages of our careers. A good corporate salon will allow you like freedom to start to step out on your own, but they also support you whenever you start to get shaky or start to become unsure. There's a lot of support in those places. So it's a great transition from school to, you Mm -hmm. know, working your own chair. So when Mm -hmm. you started going out, how did you hustle new business? Was it just sit back and wait for new people to come in or were you interactive and going out and, and getting friends or, or how were you doing it? I was at my prime. <laughs> so I was like, I was, I was, I think when I started working, cause I was working at this corporate salon at 21 or at 20. And then when I came to house of pop, I was 22 at that time. I felt like I was really powerful. So I had no shame. I put myself out there. I like to show up. I like attention on me as well. So I definitely had no problem going out of my way to um, put myself out there and let people know 
you know, what I do, um, especially when I started at House of Pop, that's really when I had to do it my own. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I was very annoying on social media because, again, I didn't have many clients that followed me, I think, um, from that that corporate salon to House of Pop. I think Mm -hmm. I probably have a good five to six people that followed me. Mm -hmm. And so at House of Pop, Douglas was very, you know, just like whatever, you know, you stay busy as much as you can. And if you're not, you don't have clients, like I want you to be going out of your way to go uh, to look for something or at least have any of your friends here and just be busy in your chair. So yeah, I was posting constantly. I would maybe post on Facebook and Instagram like twice in the morning and maybe one in the afternoon and evening, like every day. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I was very annoying on social media. I probably got (laughs) muted and hidden, but a lot of people are probably unfriended and unfollowed. And honestly, I did not care. I was like, (laughs) I am working in this really cool place. So come here. And I was taking a lot of selfies in that salon. So <laughs> we have good lighting there. So yeah. <laughs> so I, I, for me, the hustle, it was actually a lot more exciting than like hustling, like, or, you know, like trying to get people in my chair. I just want people to know, like, this yeah. is where I'm at. I'm at this mm-hmm. really cool place and you guys better come here. You know, I, yeah, yeah. let's do it. Taking action in spite of any yeah. kind of fear or any kind of lack of confidence, yeah. going yeah. for it and doing it anyway. Yeah. Oh, part of it, I, I just feel like part of it is like really taking pride in what you're able to do, you know? And yeah. it's like, I, yeah. I'm not super fan of the term, like fake it till you make it. I understand it. Um, I don't love it, but what I do think people, instead of faking it, be prideful in mm-hmm. the industry, be prideful in your job, be prideful that you want people to come and see what you do, where you work, what you can, how you can transform them, the skills that you do have available to you, even if they're very few, like just be really proud of that. And I think that can really help change the way people think about hustle culture and Mm -hmm. going out and talking to people. Cause it's not, Oh, I do hair. You know, here's my card. Come see me. But it's like, hell yeah, I do hair. Like I'm doing some hair. Totally. (laughs) And like at that age, like 22 and we're located like downtown, um, Spokane and, you know, there are several businesses around us. Um, Spokane is really cool because there's a lot of independent owned businesses and lots of locals that support those. So I, in between appointment gaps or when I have openings, I would just go to any businesses. I would purposely wear my color stained outfits or clothes. <laughs> I wore ex- clothes that are extra. I, my hands were purple, you know, some of my hands were brown. My fingers were brown <laughs> from coloring. I did not use gloves when I was washing hair. Did I say that? I, probably not. But either people thought I was a plumber or a painter. I don't know. But all I know is wherever I went in public, it was starting a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that remember, was an opportunity. I remember one time I had uh, gone to the dry cleaners and I had mm-hmm. these these cutting clips on my, my sleeve and I walked in and dropped a bunch of stuff off and a girl standing there. She's like, can I ask you a question? Are those hair clips? I said, oh, yes, yes, they are. Are you a hairdresser? Yes, I am. And then we started a consultation and I have done her hair and her mother's hair for probably the past 15 years because of that one oh, interaction mm-hmm. right there. And now she's mm-hmm. got two daughters. I do their hair. So it, it, you know, it's good to advertise in some way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know there's like this funny thing, especially in the bar scene, you know, or like Mm -hmm. in the nightlife, um, there are hairdressers there that are very frustrated. It's like they don't want to tell them, uh, let people know that they're hairdressers because drunken, um, let's say (laughs) drunken Sandra, she's like, I really want to go blonde, you know, but I took advantage of those opportunities. I really did. I, Mm -hmm. um. I enjoyed it at that time. Now I don't, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm lucky now that I'm in the, I'm in a place where I, I mean, I have a good clientele, but at that time I'm like, yes, girl, I have to turn it on. You know, I had mm-hmm. to turn the, yeah. that little snappy snap that people probably liked. The charm. Um, yeah. The Sandra, Sandra, Sandra's never met anyone like this. So <laughs> let's go. <laughs> what advice would you give to the future hairdressers of the industry who are really timid about having to go out there, hand out cards, talk to people, get those Mm -hmm. people to come into the salon or who are even timid about doing social media posts about it. I think 
a big part of it is get to know yourself first. Know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. We're all different. Every single one of us. I think there are people out there that, you know, are very introvert. Mm -hmm. But they might be really good at talking to other people when it comes to technicality, technicality, I mean. Um, So if they can use that, if they can uh, with social media or whatnot, I think one of the biggest part is know yourself and what you like and what you don't like. And then Mm kind of navigate how you can make this happen for you, I guess. Does -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's okay. It's okay to say no. So if you're talking to somebody and they've got long hair down to their back, and they want to go platinum blonde, you can say, you know, that's not really my specialty. That's not what I do. Yeah. Uh You know, I do short hair or whatever. You can can say no. You can work your way around it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was literally Mm -hmm. just thinking that. That's so funny. (laughs) Because I I think, like, when you're thinking about students and new professionals, people that are still in that uh, client building stage, Mm -hmm. um, School teaches I, them that they have to do everything on everybody. To. Yes, and that's like not you true. have to say yes. And mm-hmm. I think that's something that's really like, quote, healthy or like boundary setting or whatever yeah. is I think it's good. Like Gerald just said, know yourself, know what you want, and then be able to learn how to say, well, that's not really where I am really good at right now, but you should go see, you know, the person mm-hmm. next to me who is really good at that. Or mm-hmm. that's not a skill that I have you know, gotten a solid foundation on yet, maybe in a year, come back to me and and I'd love to do that look on you or something. I think it's so important for kids today to realize that no is an option Mm -hmm. in the beginning to set those boundaries with clients. Mm -hmm. Because something else about Gerald that I just, I'm going to boost him up a little bit because I'm so proud of him watching him do this over (laughs) Uh the last like while (laughs) is I, I feel like Gerald had kind of some boundary issues with clients. Clients were taking advantage. They were talking to him in a way that I found completely inappropriate, um, taking advantage of his time and his kindness and, you know, saying, no, I want to be booked on this day at this time. And, and I think for a while, Gerald felt like, well, I have to keep this client happy. So I'm going to do whatever, whatever Mm -hmm. they want, you know, even if that's not bringing me a lot of peace and joy in my own life. And I would say over the last two years, I have seen this total 180 with Gerald where he holds his boundaries. He doesn't take clients after his work day. And if he does, it's a very, you know, special situation like his mom or something. Mm -hmm. I love seeing her come in. Mm -hmm. She's always so excited. And, you know, it's like watching him have to work through that and grow into that has been a real joy, honestly, because Mm -hmm. you not only see it, how his clients respect him now, but also how he is able to show up to work a hundred percent every day for the people that are on his books. And then he's able to leave and kind of refresh himself. Yeah. A a thing that I think most people don't realize is that this industry will force you to grow as a person, whether you want to or not, Uh unless you're going to stay stagnant down at the bottom rungs of the ladder. But, you know, it's just like when you first start, you want to learn the technicality of something, how to technically do something. Then after you get good at that, it takes about four to five years. You get technically skilled. You can handle pretty much anything that walks in the front door. Then you start to learn interpersonal relationships on how I can deal with a large variety of people that come into the salon. The more people that I can deal with and and connect with and talk to, the wider the variety of clients that I can have and the more successful I'll be. Then after that point, I have to start gauging myself. How can I get out of my own way so that I can remain successful and grow from that? And that's where a lot of people start saying, you know what? I'm so busy now. It's okay for me to get rid of somebody that's not helping me in my long-term goals. And then after you do that, you start thinking, okay, I've done this for 15, 20 years. How can I start being financially successful and being financially responsible so I can buy a house? I can buy that Mercedes. I can buy these things. And then you start thinking, okay, well, how can I just minimize my clientele, but maximize my earnings. So it's, it's a constant growing process and it's, it, it comes, in uh-huh. comes in it's stages, comes and grows in stages. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say that like, in addition to like Annie's question earlier, besides knowing yourself, I think a lot of us need to understand that life is not going to get any easier, you know, as we yep. grow. So I think 
as humans, we are built, this is just my beliefs or whatever, but we are built to take challenges and yeah. we are built mm-hmm. to be challenged. Mm-hmm. So anytime it gets hard and it comes from like our own head and our own heart, you know, like mm-hmm. there's things that we have to do that we don't want to do. But in that, in those moments, that's where I kind of take those as a challenge where I'm like, yeah. you know what? I just have to go through this right now. Mm-hmm. Um, Annie was mentioning mm-hmm. earlier that, yes, I did allow people back then to like kind of in a way walk all over me or whatever. Mm-hmm. I was in a way aware what was happening, but I was also at the same time training myself to uh, to just take it at that time. Because for me, how I saw that was this is what I have to get through right now. If I can't take this, how else am I going to take what's going to come on in life? You know, it's only going to mm-hmm. get harder. And it, there there really was this pivotal moment, too, that was super visual in your career a couple of years ago when you did start setting those really healthy boundaries. Because now mm-hmm. today, even though it's been a bit of a journey, I can see the way your clients talk to you differently. I can see that they are way more respectful of your time and schedule mm-hmm. and they know, okay, well... Okay, they're telling me that I can't get in with Gerald at this time. So can I, when is his next availability? Instead of demanding, you know, we'll talk to him, get him, have him get me in, you know, like it it changes the conversations. It changes the kind of the whole dynamic of that client hairdresser relationship. When you start putting in those boundaries, they'll, they do start respecting you eventually. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now you're at a point where like, I don't feel like you're overloaded. You're not as burnt out at the end of the day. Like you, you like this, I don't even know how to state it, but it's like Gerald has this like essence and this vibe that Mm. he brings with him when he walks into any room and it's a hundred percent all the time now because, you know, I think you're able to. Yeah. Honestly, I built a lot of (laughs) confidence within myself when I took on a lot of those challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like, if anyone can take it in the in those times, it was me. I felt like looking back, I didn't really think like that while it was happening. But looking back, that's kind of how I saw it now. And that's why now it's like after going and, you know, personal stuff happens in my personal life. I can't get those negative experiences go to waste if I'm just going to give up now or like not be who I am. Like I'm going to mm-hmm. come out of it strong. And yes, I would, you know, like personal stuff and work stuff and professional things like she's gone through it you know so at the end of the day (laughs) i'm gonna just stand here and high mighty you know it's just Mm -hmm. like yeah i I love myself i will and when i'm in that headspace zone i will kind of like spread it out to people around me if i can Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. it's a growing process you know and Mm -hmm. and as annie was talking about the client who's well you know just i want to talk to to russell you know and they're all every hairdresser barber in the world will have nurse ratchet who has been going to you for so long and she calls you up or she comes in and says, Hey, you know, I need to get in Saturday and it's Wednesday. And you're like, well, girl, I'm freaking booked for three weeks out. I can't get you in until so-and-so. Well, I'm just going to have to go somewhere else. And in the beginning, you're like, Oh no, 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 no. Let's see what we can do. Let's try to work it in. And then you get to the point where it's like, well, bitch, you can go somewhere else. And when they <laughs> fuck your hair up, you can come back and I'll fix it and charge you a regular price. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know, I know you'll come back. You'll yeah, come back. You'll be yes. back. You'll yes. be back. <laughs> yeah. But if when they got get come back, I've also learned to like, you know what? I will always take you back. You know, I'm not gonna like hold this <laughs> yeah. against you. No. Because you know, no. you came back to see me. It takes a lot of no audacity to come back so it's like okay let's do it let's go well, i'm not they gonna gotta, make it they gotta fight. learn too you know they've yeah, got to yeah, learn too exactly yeah. i feel <laughs> when it comes to like boundaries and stuff having learned what you've learned since you have really started on that process what what advice would you give to again the students and new professionals in the industry on setting those like do you feel like students and new professionals should have those healthy boundaries or should they kind of go through that process to learn those healthy boundaries? For me, I had to go through that process because I feel like I've gotten better to know myself. I've learned that sometimes I have to learn the hard way to set something up for myself, you know, um, Mm -hmm. to learn basically. Yeah. I think it's really important to set up boundaries when you get the chance to, when you get there, Um, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's very important. When when if if it feels right to apply it in that moment, 
after going through a lot of stuff, if something repeats, you know, right. maybe it's time to like handle this differently. And now it's boundaries. Okay. For me, a lot of it came from personal life too, you know, learning to really boundaries outside of professional and being able to apply that in my professionalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, we're in a service business. So of course we want to serve and, and take mm -hmm. care of people. But at the, so, yeah. at, the, at the end of the day, I've only got so much energy that I yeah. can give. And then at a certain point when I feel like I'm exactly. giving too much, then I have to be responsible to myself mm -hmm. and be my own best friend and say, Hey bro, yeah. let, 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 let's draw the line here. You know, mm -hmm. so yes. sometimes you got to step over to realize, oh, mm -hmm. that's where the line is. Okay, I need to step right. back. Mm -hmm. It's like that saying, you know, an empty cup can't pour. So <laughs> right. it's that's just, right. that's right. My, it's like my, my cup is running out, <laughs> it's drying out, it's evaporated, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. I can't get there. You know, I, yeah. I feel like, like this idea of this hustle culture and boundaries, they go so much hand in hand. I remember at one of my very first salon jobs uh, out of school, they were kind of, they had us in the mindset of you take everything, mm -hmm. anything yeah. and everything that mm -hmm. comes your way, you do not say no to. Yeah. And I remember there was one night, it was a Saturday, a girl hit me up on, on Instagram and was like, I really, I really want to get my hair done with you. Like, but I, I needed to get it done now. She showed up at the salon at eight o'clock at night and we stayed there until midnight doing hair. It was gorgeous. <laughs> and there was no one around to like, see this awesome work I had done, especially for where my skill level was at, at that time. It was like, hell yeah. Like I nailed this. And I look back on that and I'm like, I wish I would have never done that to myself. Like, I wish I wouldn't have been in the salon until midnight with a client just because I wasn't, I didn't know how to say no to somebody because there's not only are you by yourself in the salon with a client, but there are so many bad things that can happen. You could get hurt. They could not pay you. And how do you deal with that? They could like run out and you just did all that work for free. Like there's so many negative things that I think people don't think about when they think about say no to somebody, but like, it's not only for your mental safety and, and health, but it's also for your physical safety and health as mm -hmm. well. And not putting yourself in those situations, you know, to respect the time that you have scheduled out to be at work and not, and then to be able to leave and go home. And that's part of the initiation <laughs> process though, is, yeah. is being there till midnight and cutting someone's bangs mm -hmm. way too short and yeah. frying something to where it breaks <laughs> off and coloring mm -hmm. something that you thought was a level six and it's a level two. And you're like, Oh <laughs> shit. You yeah. Know, that's, there's so Sometimes many initiation you, processes, you know. There, yeah, and <laughs> I feel like I've learned, you know. To me, I'm glad I allowed those things to happen. Looking back, or mm -hmm. I allowed myself to do those bend over backwards 360 for somebody. Um, even though now those are my two 3 a.m. thoughts that are like haunting me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> why did I allow myself? But at the end of the day, I have to like appreciate myself for having the capability mm -hmm. of doing that. I re I remember one time I was in the salon on. It was it was probably a Saturday, and since me and, and the guys didn't have anywhere to go, we'd go hang out at my dad's salon, and I was, you know, learning and stuff like this, and some drunk comes in, and I mean, he was lit on fire, and he wanted a haircut, and I thought, <laughs> sure, what the hell, sit down, buddy, and I'm just taking, he just wanted like it buzzed, you know, like a number five or something all, all over. I went to take the attachment and run it up his head. And right before I hit, right before I got to his head, the attachment fell off and then plain the back of his head right here. Oh, it no. skinned it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, hey, you want another beer? Hell yeah, I want another beer. <laughs> he didn't even care. <laughs> oh, that, man. That's part of the process. Initiation, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's something that, you know, again, looking back, like sometimes I didn't really think about why those things were happening then. But now it's like, yep, it was part of it. And that's why I'm at where I'm at now. Or like my mental state is where it's at now. So back then, girl, I was like, I would just get so mm, just function. <laughs> my my brain was something else, but my body could do different things. I'm like, mm, okay, let's just let's just keep doing this right now. <laughs> so so what are your future goals? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? I see myself in the same I, I don't know. I feel like I'm still gonna be constantly growing. Mm -hmm. in 10 years. Um, I still see myself being with my clientele and, you know, working and doing hair still. Uh, 
I think, I mean, back then I never had a particular goal, my mentality in the beginning. So I think moving forward, that's going to be the mentality I'm still going to have. It's just like, take things as they come. I don't know what it's really going to go to, but all I know is I can trust myself enough to mm -hmm. like, just go through it and mm -hmm. do deal with it. Daryl is one of those people that is like, he's truly such an inspiration there. He has multiple of his friends who are currently in cosmetology school which I think is so awesome that there are people surrounding him that have just been so inspired by his career and his, the way that he thinks and who he is and the way that he presents himself, that they want to emulate that and join this industry, which I think is what that that's kind of the whole point, you know, is to like be these inspirations to future hairdressers and to help mm -hmm. show them what an incredible the industry this is. And it's definitely part of the reason I wanted Gerald on this podcast because of how truly awe-inspiring he is every single day when he shows up because he shows up every day and not everybody does that. You take a point yeah. until the eight o'clock on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. Because <laughs> um... he has boundaries. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sweet. That's, we, that's part of growth. We got boundaries now. <laughs> But yeah, definitely. I think I always look at it as, especially with when I see myself on somebody who is just starting, you know, I want to be that person that I felt like I needed. But there was a time that I took that too seriously where I almost was like being too like, you know, like Captain Save a Ho for them. Can I say that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anyways. So, but now I've also learned, you know, you know what? I'll just be myself. And the people that will take learning from it will take learning from it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then, it, you know, it's up to them. It's also me accepting people for who they are if they want to learn from me. It's like they got to take it how they want to learn it, you know, or mm -hmm. how they can learn it. And I can't do that for them. Mm -hmm. I can't be because there was a time I think that I was very like in a way controlling of like, no, this is how you learn. This is to people that were looking up to me. But now I'm like, you know what? Do what works for you. For anyone who's currently listening, I do highly recommend if you'd like to continue to be inspired by Gerald, follow him on social media. Um, mm -hmm. I believe he's on all the social medias. <laughs> yes. Which will Look be linked name. in the yes. description of the podcast. Mm -hmm. So you could check it out right there and go follow him online. Uh, Gerald, I'm just so grateful that you came on here to share Thank you. your journey yeah. and your wisdom and your inspiration. Okay. Thank you. It means a lot. I mean, again, I've listened to several episodes of this podcast and it's just nice to be reminded. And that's one of my process right now to keep my um, passion, you know, for the industry. It's like sometimes I got to listen to other people's experiences or other perspectives. And then I myself, I'm like, OK, I, I'm doing it right. Or, you know, I'm OK right now or I'm good. Because right. a lot of times it is easy to get in that tunnel vision of like frustration or you're in the moment of, but yes, it's nice to just open your ears up quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on and please uh, leave us a review on Apple iTunes and Spotify and we will and see Amazon you next music. time. Oh, we're on Amazon. Yeah. We're on okay. Amazon music Woo. now too. Oh, Amazon okay. music. I have to remember that. I have to write that one down. And uh, let us know what you'd like to see on future podcasts, and we will see you next time. I'm Russell Mays, and my co-host is Annie MacArthur. We will see you soon. Bye. Bye.